Welcome to Bite Size Theology. Uh, we're starting a new series today on Christology, the doctrine of Christ, and today we're thinking about the humanity of Christ. And the first heading there on the sheet is the Son of God became fully human. Now, you may have noticed we don't normally have um, teaching sessions on the fact that Queen Victoria or Martin Luther King Jr. were fully human. It's just uh, obvious to everyone. But we do do this with Jesus because Jesus is unique. He wasn't simply human. He, as the heading says, became human. The only person who's ever done that. And one of the things that signalled Jesus' uniqueness right at the beginning was his unique conception, how he entered the world. Um, interestingly, we, we often talk about Jesus' virgin birth. There wasn't anything unusual about Jesus' birth. It was an ordinary birth. What was unusual was his conception. When the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she's going to have a baby, uh, her first question, understandably, this is on the sheets, is how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So Jesus uniquely was conceived by the Holy Spirit without any involvement from a human father. And it's worth reflecting for a moment on why God, have, God chose for Jesus to enter the world in this unique way. And one of the answers is that I think it communicates um, as the heading says, how the Son of God, the Divine One, um, became human. He is both divine and human. It's helpful to think about the alternatives. How else could God have done it? So, for example, God could have had Jesus entering in the, into this world with two human parents like all of us do. And then for his divine nature to be added on to him at some point later in his life, you know, like a turbo booster strapped onto him to enhance his powers but then it would have been hard for us wouldn't it to see how Jesus is fully God rather than just a turbo-powered human because his origin is so similar to ours in that respect or think of another alternative um, God could have had Jesus entering the world uh, fully formed perhaps even as an adult from heaven uh, he could have sent him to descend from heaven a bit like uh, Mary Poppins does and um, it would be hard for us to see then how Jesus was fully human as we are. It would be hard for us to see how Jesus could be part of the same human race, descended from the same ancestors. But what God did do is he chose for Jesus to enter the world through a virgin conception. And that helps us understand both Jesus' deity, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and his full humanity. He had an ordinary human birth from an ordinary human mother. So what we're thinking about is how the Son of God uh, became fully human and he did it for us. And only unlike each of us, and actually like Adam, Jesus came into the world as holy. That's what the angel Gabriel said. He came into the world untainted by original sin. And we're gonna think more about that in a moment. So what was Jesus's human experience like? There's actually only one incident um, from Jesus' childhood recorded in the Gospels. It's from Luke chapter 2, and it describes an account where Jesus' parents take him to Jerusalem, age 12, and he goes missing. Uh, and when they finally catch up with him three days later, he's in the temple. And he's sitting among the teachers, he's listening, he's asking questions, and it says all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And of course, we want to ask the question, how did this 12 year old get so wise? And instinctively, we might want to give the answer, well, it's obvious because he's God. But that's not the answer that Luke chooses to give. Luke says at the end of the passage how Jesus, this is on our sheets, increased in wisdom and in stature and in favour with God and man. So it's saying that Jesus grew in wisdom and, and his growth in wisdom was connected to his growth as a human being. He learned wisdom in the same way that you and I do, by, by meditating on, by obeying God's word. He's the blessed man of Psalm 1. He meditates on God's word day and night. And with Jesus, there were no shortcuts. Uh, he lived a human life just like we do. He's the same 
uh, means of grace that we have to, to grow in wisdom and faith every day. And I think that grasping this is very helpful as we think about Jesus. Sometimes we imagine, don't we, that Jesus is in some different category. You know, it was easy for Jesus, of course, you know, he, he wouldn't understand my struggles. But actually, Jesus became fully human. He had a, a human body just like ours. He got hungry and thirsty and tired. Uh, he had human emotions just like ours. He marveled at the centurion's faith. He wept at Lazarus's tomb. He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Uh, the night before he died, he experienced such sorrow that he thought it might even kill him. He had a mind just like ours. Uh, the Bible says he learned obedience through what he suffered in Hebrews 5. Um, God was gradually giving him uh, greater and greater difficulties through his life so that bit by bit he was being prepared for the tougher tests which lay ahead. And all of this means he is able to understand us and to help us in a way that he wouldn't have been able to otherwise. This is what is taught in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. So is this saying that he didn't understand our struggles beforehand? Well, let's put it this way. If you're approaching surgery, perhaps you've got to have a tumour out, something like that. Uh, you can get a lot of help um, from the professor of surgery. Perhaps, you know, she knows everything that's ever been written about this procedure. She knows exactly what it's going to be like. But then she shares with you how she found it when she had the same operation five years ago. And the difference that makes is immediate, that the comfort that she can give, the help she can give you is at a much deeper level now. And that is the comfort of this verse. Jesus can help us not simply as the Lord over our troubles, but as the fellow sufferer with us in our troubles. And that makes all the difference. And that mention of um, Jesus' temptations in Hebrews 2 brings us neatly onto our second heading on the sheets. Jesus was tempted, but he never sinned. There's one place in, in John 8 uh, where Jesus is standing up before a whole crowd of people and he says, which one of you convicts me of sin? This is a, cloud, a crowd that would have included some of his closest friends, his fiercest opponents, and he's saying, look, can any of you mention one sin I've ever done? Anything. Just, just what is it? And I think this is one of the most extraordinary things we discover about the Lord Jesus. Often when somebody in the public eye is, is very you know, famous, they're highly regarded, um, we then ask someone who knows them well, who's close to them, and we discover that under the surface there's all kinds of pride or selfish ambition that you miss from a distance. But actually, the people who knew Jesus the best, uh, the ones who spent years with him, day in, day out, under all kinds of pressures, all of them testify, here is someone who never sinned. And when we describe Jesus as sinless, it describes what he's not. You know, he's not selfish, he's not fickle, he's not proud. But it can leave us thinking that there was something lacking or smaller about Jesus' life, something constrained. But actually, it's precisely the opposite. Jesus' life was bigger and freer. Jesus was brimming over with life. He was kinder than the summer. People found him just so magnetic uh, that they wanted to be near him. This is what a truly holy life looks like. It's deeply positive and it's wonderfully attractive. So the question is, was Jesus tempted as we are, I'll put that question on the sheets and I'll put immediately distinguo. This is something we're learning to yell in Bite Size Theology uh, because the answer is yes and no. And we need to make some distinctions before we answer the question. Um, Hebrews 4.15 is a famous verse which talks about Jesus' temptations being like ours. And it says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And we're going to think about what a comfort this verse brings us in a moment. But before we hear what it's saying, we just need to hear what it's not saying. Uh, we need to be careful not to absolutize the verse and make it mean something that it was never intended to. 
And I put there, Jesus' temptations were not like ours in some ways. Um, unlike most of our temptations, Jesus' temptations were never caused by indwelling sin, greed or lust or selfish ambition or envy. Uh, we already heard, didn't we, the angel Gabriel announced that Jesus is holy. He was like Adam 2.0. He was untainted. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, Paul says, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh. And the key word there is likeness. Jesus was not actually in sinful flesh. And when you look at Jesus' temptations in the wilderness in Matthew 4, which we'll think about in a moment, the devil's temptations come from outside, uh, like Adam experienced them in the garden, not from within. So Jesus' temptations were, were not like ours in some ways, but also, and some of this has got clearer to me in the last week, Jesus' temptations were not even like Adam's in some ways. Now, obviously, in some ways, Jesus' temptations were more like Adam's than they are like ours, because neither Adam nor Christ had sinful natures. But I think there's an important sense in which Christ's temptations weren't even like Adam's. And that is that Christ was not merely peccable, that's the technical term, which means able not to sin, like Adam was, but Christ was impeccable. That means he was not even able to sin. Do you see the difference? Adam could have sinned or not sinned. Jesus couldn't sin. Now, this is an area where Christians disagree, and I think we're kind of at the limits of what the Bible reveals to us as we talk about this. But let me explain why I think this is the case. Um, when Jesus says in uh, John eight twenty nine, I put on the sheets, I always do those things which please the Father. I think Jesus is saying there more than Adam, for example, could have said before the fall. He's not just saying so far this has been my experience, that I find pleasure in pleasing God. He's saying this is a settled truth about me. This has always been true and it always will be true. Actually, if you think about it, if Jesus could have sinned on earth, what really is there to prevent him from sinning in heaven in the future? Heaven is the same environment in which Satan fell, for example. So it's possible to sin in heaven. But wonderfully, Jesus never will. And that is because of who Jesus is, because of his divine identity, the, the divine son of God. He will always do those things which please the father. He cannot sin. It's part of his divine nature, which can't be violated. But then, of course, the objection comes and we're all thinking it. How then were Jesus' temptations real? if there was no real risk of him going the wrong way? You know, what, was it a real drama or was he just kind of skating, breezing through with a kind of force field around him, making it look like there was temptation when it wasn't real? Uh, and my attempt to answer this is to say that there are two different ways something can be real, a real drama. Um, so think in terms of a hero story where at the climax of the story that the hero is going to be tested as to whether he's faithful to his true love, even though it's going to be costly. Well, one option for the drama is that he's a very flawed hero and the drama comes from the uncertainty. Will he be faithful or won't he? But there's another kind of drama which is also real and it's the kind of drama Jesus was part of. Jesus was always going to be unflinching in his loyalty to God and the outcome was never actually in doubt. But the, the realness of it comes from the fact that he still had to go through the most gruelling of tests. He was taken to the absolute limit and yet he still prevailed despite the cost. So there's nothing unreal about what Jesus had to go through, even though the outcome of it wasn't ever in doubt. So uh, having seen the ways in which Jesus' temptations are not like ours, in certain respects, and not even like Adam's in some respects, let's think about point C, Jesus' temptations were like ours in the most important ways. 
Now, the clearest descriptions of Jesus' temptations in the Bible are his time in the desert, uh, recorded in Matthew 4, and then in Gethsemane. And whilst there's something unique about Jesus' temptations, there's lots we discover here which is in common with the kind of temptations we face day by day. So, for example, the first one, Jesus is tempted. He's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil tells him to turn stones into bread. Now, that is a level of hunger, a level of longing, which I guess many of us will never experience. But, but, so there's no question there that Jesus fully understands unfulfilled desire. He knows what it is to ache uh, with longing, to be weak with desire. He understands. Or take the second temptation. Um, Jesus was tempted, do you remember, to prove that he's the son of God by jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. And Jesus understands the desire for assurance of the Lord's care. Jesus knows what it is to feel alone and in need of comfort, in need of encouragement. Or we'll take the third temptation where Jesus was tempted to short circuit and bypass the cross and receive the kingdoms of this world without going through suffering. You see, he understands this desire to take the easy way out and avoid suffering. And of course, this final temptation to avoid the cross, we see growing through his life to a climax in the Garden of Gethsemane. So much so that he was sweating blood and he was praying with loud cries and tears. The point is that Jesus knew temptation actually in a much stronger way than any of us will. Partly because it was a, a direct attack from Satan himself, partly because the devil was pushing him to the absolute limit. In, in Hebrews 12, the believers are told that in their struggle against sin, they haven't yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Uh, and that is a contrast with Jesus. The point is that those who, who yield to temptation, who give in at the first hurdle, they never know its full intensity. But Jesus experienced the full force in a way that we don't, because we give in too early. And all the time, Jesus conquered by using the same weapons that we have to use. Fellowship, the word of God, prayer, learning obedience. Jesus engaged in the same battle that we face, only much, much harder. And wonderfully, he came out victorious. What a saviour. And that brings us on to our final point. All of this was for us. Jesus' sinless humanity is essential for our salvation. Now, the most moving part of the gospel narrative for me is the bit where Jesus is in the garden and he's pleading with his father, if there's any other way, any other way, yet not what I will, but what you will. It was essential for Jesus to complete his journey and go through the cross for us to be saved. But actually, the whole of Jesus' journey, right from the start, right from taking flesh in the first place, it was all necessary for our salvation. There was no other way, and yet Jesus did it willingly for us. So firstly, Jesus needed to be human to be our mediator. Uh, because we were alienated from God, we needed someone to be our go-between, our middleman, someone who could represent God to us, i.e. someone divine, and someone who can represent us to God, i.e. someone human. And so to fulfil this role, Jesus obviously needed to become human. I put there 1 Timothy 2. So there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And Jesus didn't simply need to become a human, he needed to become a male specifically in order to be the new Adam our representative. Romans 5 says this, but as by the one man's disobedience, Adam, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. If you could think of it this way, if let's say we're building a tower and we get as far as the fifth floor and we realise we've been building it wonky, uh, what do you do? Well, the bad thing to do is to carry on building and try and wonk it back in the other direction. What we should do is to go back to the start and, and rebuild from the beginning. And to fix humanity's problem, Jesus needed to go right back 
and put things straight at exactly the point where Adam had put them off on a wonk. Jesus needed to go back and be a new Adam, a new representative. And Jesus didn't simply need to start again. He also needed to clean up the mess which Adam had left. And to do that, he also needed to be human. So that, as I put there, he could be our substitute. Um, Hebrews 2 describes this. Therefore, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. You see, if Jesus had become an angel, or if Jesus had become any other non-human creature, he couldn't have then been as substitute. He couldn't have absorbed and propitiated God's wrath for us. It was only as a human being that he could take the place of human beings and die for our sins. And finally, Jesus' humanity is also essential for him to be our pattern uh, in life and beyond. Uh, repeatedly in the Bible, we're called to be like Jesus, to walk the way he walked, to be conformed to his image, to follow in his steps, to become like him in his death. Jesus needed to become human in order to be our pattern, the one we're to copy, to model how we're to live. But Jesus also needed to be human in order to be our pattern for resurrection life. This is the point made in 1 Corinthians 15. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So Jesus was raised with a human resurrection body in order that he could be the first fruits uh, for us to follow. This is the pattern of life that we will one day uh, follow on that day when we are finally raised with resurrection bodies like his. So just to summarise, uh, Jesus has entered into our mess and he's done it not just to be with us, not just to understand us, but he's done it to save us. Um, I read a while back about eight potholders. They got trapped in an underground cave in eastern France and the rescuers, they had to squeeze through a tiny hole to get to them. But of course, the point of being with them wasn't mainly to hold their hands. The rescuers entered into that cave in order to get them home. And in that same way, God has entered into our human experience, not just to be with us, wonderful though that is, but to give us hope and salvation and transformation and a glorious future with him. What a saviour we have. Thank you so much for joining us in this bite-sized theology. Do come back next time.